study. If everyone would rise, please. <clears throat> A heavenly Father, in the name of Christ Jesus, we bow here before you, thanking you for your Bible, thanking you for your teaching that you've given us out of that, Father. That is the truth. Your Bible is the truth. The only thing we can trust is your word. So we ask, Father, for your inspiration. We ask, Father, for your sanctification upon this room, upon everyone here, that we will learn something tonight from your word. And so we ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So we're going okay here. Well, I want us to turn to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 3. I want to go through a subject tonight uh, that I touched on the Sabbath, and I want to pick another word here. Okay, this is 2 Timothy 2, and we're going to start in verse 3. And uh, since Bella is ready, no, she isn't ready, Marie is ready. Will you read 2 Timothy 2, verses 1, 2, and 3? 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, verses 1, 2, and 3. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Stop right there. That verse 3 is what we're going to talk about tonight. Therefore endure. Endure. And I, I was really surprised, and you all may be tonight, with this word endure is used throughout the New Testament. And it is, we'll see, it has so many meanings to it. It's not just one meaning. And the word right here is uh, to undergo hardship. Anyone go, undergoing any hardship? To be afflicted, to suffer troubles. So that's what that word means right here. It said, therefore, as a good, therefore, undergo hardship, be afflicted, suffer troubles for Jesus Christ, because you're going to have to do that. Now let's go to Psalms 34 and verse 19. Psalms 34 and verse 19. Psalms 34 and verse 19 is what David said in the Psalms about anyone that will follow God, follow the truth. Psalms 34 and verse 19. Now, um, Marie, since you have the mic, will you read that also? Psalms 34 and verse 19. Let not them no, Psalms 34 and verse 19. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Psalms 34 and verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Keep on. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. There you are. See, he brings out something. He says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. And that's what that word endure mean in the New, in old, in the New Testament. It means be afflicted. So many are the afflictions, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. And verse 22 is, the Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. You know what a desolate place is. If I took this table here and took everything off of it, it would be desolate, nothing on there. Because normally when someone is afflicting you or giving you a hard time, they're threatening to take your life, your furniture, your home, your money. They're, they're, they're going to take something from you, your freedom. And he said, you're not going to be desolate. God is going to leave you desolate if you trust in him. So this is why he told uh, Timothy to endure. That means to undergo hardship, to be afflicted, to suffer troubles, 
because what does it say right here? The Lord shall deliver them out of you, out of them all. It doesn't say how quickly. <laughs> it doesn't say how quickly, but it says it will, he will deliver you out of them all. So stay with it. That's what it's saying. And that's one word for afflict. That means to undergo hardship, to be afflicted, to suffer troubles. Now here's another one, Matthew 24. Matthew 24, this is one that we know because we read this many times, and I want you all to read Matthew 24 and verse, Three, Matthew 24 and verse 3. Will you start there, Marie, please? This is talking about Jesus Christ. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Mm -hmm. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors mm -hmm. of wars. See that ye be not troubled. Mm -hmm. For all these things must come to pass, but the, what the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, mm -hmm. and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Stop right there. Did you see what he said here? Verse 13, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And the word there is protected. What is he talking about on this is? The words uh, endure, that means to stay under, to bear up, to have intestinal fortitude. You've got to bear up, stay under, intestinal fortitude. Do not give up. And he tells you why in verse 13. He that shall endure, he that shall stay under, he that shall bear up, he or she may have intestinal fortitude. And the next word is a key one. Unto the end. Now, what does he mean the end? End is the word telos. And it means, let me read it first and then I'll explain it. To set out for a definite point or a goal, a limit, the conclusion of an act. You know what that's saying? It is saying. They said, what is going to come before you return and gather your church? He said, you're going to have wars and rumors of wars. You're going to have sorrows. You're going to have famine. You're going to have race, racial wars. You're going to have race against race. When you see nation against nation, that's nativity. Your nativity is what you were born. Like I was, I'm an African. My nativity is Africa. Bellows is Spain. You know, different, your nativity against nativity is going to happen on this earth. And there are going to be earthquakes, and that word for earthquakes are commotions, tsunamis, tornadoes, hurricanes, a lot of stuff going on in different places. And verse 80 said, this is only the beginning of sorrows. And the word there for sorrows is birth pains. And I think most people here understand, women do, that had children, understand birth pains. You, you feel the baby kick, you, you, then 10 minutes apart, then they're nine minutes apart, then they're five minutes apart, and they get, they, they're kicking in the, because from what I heard, I haven't had one. <laughs> what I heard, it, it becomes a little more intense as it goes along. And so he said, these are just the beginning of sorrows, 
And then he mentions about false teachers and they're going to kill you and all of those type of things. But it, the key is here, but he that shall endure until the end of those things I just mentioned. Not all of these other things. Doesn't, doesn't mean until the end, two, three, four, five years down the line, there's a limit. He's going to have certain people go through a definite point or definite goal, and they got to go to that point, and then he's going to save them. Some other people have to go through these other points here later on. Everyone will not have to go through the same thing. That, that is key to this. To, it's a, to set out for a definite point or goal. He's having these things done to get those people to a certain juncture, and then he's going to get them out of it, and some other people are going to go through this other part of it here. The conclusion of an act. The act will be these uh, wars and rumors of wars and commotions and famines and earthquakes and, and false teachers and they're going to hate you. And you make it through that. Make it through the conclusion of that. I'm going to save you out of it. But that means some other people will have to go through these other things. That's what it's talking about. It doesn't mean you got to go through this, this, and this. Oh, I can't live through all of this. No, you can't. You can't. God knows that. So he says you will have to go through a certain part, and it will be limited to a certain time. And then he says here, look another verse here. Verse 22, he said, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And the word there is uh, to dock them. You don't, it, it's not, the word dock means when you work, you are working for $10 an hour. And you work, and you shouldn't make, for eight, you shouldn't make $80 a day. But if you only work eight, He's not going to give you, give you the whole 80. I mean, eight hours. He's going to give you the $80. I mean, he's not going to give you, he's going to dock your pay. He's not going to give it all to you. I, that happened to me once. I was working in a field and I had a bag and, and I filled some, put some dirt in it. <laughs> and they weighed it and they said, oh, 90 pounds. And I poured it out and some, some dirt was in it. Got dirt in your bag. I, oh, I told my grandfather. My grandfather said, dock him. Dock him. They hadn't it. They knocked off about 10 pounds. They only paid me for 80. They docked me. They didn't give it all to me. That's what it means. Here, he's not going to let everyone go through all of this. He's going to goop, cut the days short for the elect's sake. So that's why he's saying, endure until the end or to the point where I want you to go. I don't know what point he wants us to go to. I don't know. Some think we're at the end of the point right now. We're not. I know that. But I don't know what point he expects us to live through. Hebrews 12 and verse 7. We'll go over to Mar know, Marie. Go over to Rose. Hebrews 12 and verse 7. So you only have to go through a certain amount. And then he will stop. And he said, I will save you out of that. But someone else will have to go through the other part of it. Hebrews 12 and verse 7. Hebrews 12 and verse 7. Will someone read that? I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Rose, will you read that, please? If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth chasten not? Keep on, please. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof mm -hmm. all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrupted us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Stop right there. Or read verse 10 also. For they verify for a few days chastened us, after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, 
that we might be partakers of his holiness. Yes. Now, he said you endure, and that's that same word again, stay under, bear up. When you go through chastening, you know, maybe parents don't chasten their children. Now, we, they used to paddle us. <laughs> uh, I see, well, my parents used to, grandparents and parents used to paddle their kids when they did something wrong. They didn't, they didn't know fully what, what it meant, but that chastening, he said, it doesn't feel good. But take the chastening. If you've lied, if you've stolen, you've done something wrong, they come in and want to pile you on your seat, you should take that. Stay under that. But it's not going to last forever. <laughs> all, of, all of the kids, Bella, were you ever chastened when you were a girl? You were? <laughs> Bella, <laughs> you were. <laughs> but, but when you were going through it, it, it was very uncomfortable. But it did stop. It did stop. You know, maybe two, three, four. Oh, this is so humiliating. Oh, it hurts, it hurts. Then it stops. That's what it's saying right here. Go through the part you have to go through because it will stop. Please understand that. That includes anything you go through as a saint or as a Christian. You're going to go through certain things. They will stop eventually. It may last a year, six months, one day, uh, 10 years, nine years, 20 years. I don't know how much it may, may last, but you're going to go through various chastenings and it will stop. And that's what he's talking about there. If you just go through this part of the wars and rumors of war, fights and struggles and riots and whatever, all this stuff going on, you're going to go through that. Bear up under it. Bear up under it is going to eventually stop for you. Now, someone else may have to go through another part of it. And you can read that up in Mark 13, 13. He says the same thing there about uh, uh, staring, going through certain things. Now, let's go over to John 6 and verse 27. John 6 and verse 27. We want to see endure again. Because uh, all of the things that were the time I went through, I was expelled, not expelled, but I was suspended from school. Three days, you know, three days away from your friends. That seemed, that seemed like, oh, a month. But it stopped. After the third day, I came back on the fourth day, and there were my friends were. But it's, and I needed the chastening. <laughs> yeah, it, it, was, it was, okay, this goes John 6 and verse 27. John 6 and verse 27. Uh, wait, hold on just a minute. I think, uh, read starting in verse 26. John 6, verse, verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat, which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Thank you. He says, labor for the food which endureth. And the word therefore endureth means to stay in a given place, stay in a certain relationship, abide, remain. He said, Go for that bread that endureth, that will stay forever. You want eternal life. You want to live forever. Don't labor for the bread you eat, like you ate those 5,000, ate the loaves of bread, and ate the fish. Their stomachs were full, and they came back the next day and say, feed us again. <laughs> Give us some more food. And he said, no, don't, no, labor for that bread which endureth, which will last and last and last, which is eternal life. Want that the way you want bread, the way you wanted those fish. And they wanted them too. I think the Bible says, hunger and thirst for righteousness. If you ever been real hungry, real thirsty, your throat was parched, 
You could only just one swallow of water. That's all you real, not, not a bucket, just one swallow when you're real thirsty or when you're real hungry. You just want a piece of bread. It, oh, you can eat it and that sit back. And that bread tastes like steak and bread and everything you like. One piece of bread when you're real hungry. You eat it. Oh, that's so good. He said, go after eternal life like that. Endure to stay in a given place, stay in a relationship, abide, remain, labor for that, that which is going to remain, which is going to abide. That's eternal life, the way you wanted those, bread, those, those fish and those loaves of bread. See, he gives us analogies, pictures of things that we can relate to. Because I can remember a few times, and maybe some of you all have too, been working and you were real thirsty. And you were just, you were real thirsty. You, you know how you felt. You, and, and that first swallow of water, you almost choked. It would, you were trying to swallow so quickly. Well, that's what he's talking about. Go after, like you're going after that drink of water when you're thirsty. And, and, and go after this as something that's going to last. First Peter, first Peter 1 and verse 25. See, endure. Endure, hold on, get something that's going to last. Hold on to that. First Peter 1 and verse 25. First Peter 1 and verse 25. Uh, we're going to start, start in verse 18. Starting verse 18, 1 Peter 1 and verse 18. For as much as you know that we that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest mm -hmm. in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently, mm -hmm. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass where withereth, <laughs> and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. All of this he's talking about here. And then he says, verse 25, 24, he says, grass grows, flowers grow. You all have flower gardens. You know how pretty those flowers are. And they grow up out of the ground. Even wild flowers. All through New Mexico, you can see them on the side of the road. Uh, you can see them in Arizona and places. They just grow up. But there comes a time you look out there and those flowers are turned brown and with and they drop. He said, that happens. All that beauty of them is gone. But, 25, the word of the Lord endureth. It means stay in a given place. It abides. It remains forever. Hold on to that. Hold on to that. Don't let go of it because this, these words are not going to change. They're just not. I know a man got in here, and people get in here and change words and change this word, change that word. They do that, but they'll have to, it's a curse on them. You go in here changing what God has said, the person's going to be cursed. You don't want to curse. So read it the way it is, learn it the way it is, study it the way it is, and it endures forever. It's not going to change. His word is not going to change. Malachi, we'll go to that. This is that stuff. But, so this is what he's saying. Stay with what endures forever. Hold on to the word. Malachi, you all know what scripture I got to turn to on this one. We're going to go over to Joshua and James. 
Where is this scripture? Where is it? Oh, here it is. We let Joshua read Malachi 3, verse 4. Through six, please. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old, and as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, and against false swears, swears and against those that oppress the hireling, and its wages, the widow, and the fatherless. Let turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Thank you. Verse 6, we've read. That's it. He said, you people have done some things here. I can't believe what you've done, what you've said. But for I am the Lord, the eternal, I change not. That's why you have not been consumed. I made a promise to Abraham way back in the book of Genesis, that his seed would be the seed that I would choose to work with. And in my character, and I told the truth, and I'm not going to change. You fellows have acted crazy, wild, and disrespectful, everything, all this you've done unto me. I, I really could have, and I thought about just removing you, but I changed not. I'm going to keep my word in spite of how you've acted. And this is what he was saying. Hold on to something that you know is solid. You know it's true. Don't hold on to things that are flimsy. Don't hold on to philosophy and psychology and I feel and all of that. Because tomorrow you may not feel the same way. <laughs> but, but God's word is still the same. He says, do not commit murder. That was back before, that was in Genesis, when Cain killed Abel. And he said, you deserve death, but I'm going to send you out and I'm going to do these things to you. That was, that's what he did to him. And he says the same thing today, do not commit murder. That was in the beginning, and it still stands today. When, when Achan stole that gold and silver out of Jericho, when, that, when the walls came down, he stole some, uh, a Babylonian robe, some silver and some gold, and hid it on his tent. God said, do not steal. He said it then, he's saying it today. And Achan said, well, I hid it under my tent, and I did this, I did that. And he said, bring him out. He brought him out, took Achan, and it's, and it's all of his goods, took him outside of the camp and stoned that man. He knew he shouldn't have stolen. It was, they, they were told very clearly, don't touch those things. That, those are mine. Don't you steal those. And he stole them. And they stoned him to death because that was a nation of God. God said, a person, that, a thief that steals like that, you are to stone him. And they stoned him. I don't think people were stealing gold and silver very much, very much after that. But that's what he's saying. I tell you not to do something, I mean for you not to do it. I tell you to do something, I mean for you to do it. That is, is to stay in a given place, or stay in, it must abide, it must remain. And so his character doesn't change. Hold on to that. Whatever he's promised you, he's going to fulfill it. Okay, James. We're going to go over to James now since he's sitting there. 2 Thessalonians 1 2 Thessalonians 1. We're just studying the Bible through endure. 2 Thessalonians 1. And this will help us to see, too, that it's telling us to stay where you are. Don't give up. Don't break the law. Don't lie. Don't steal. Stay where you are. Hold on to that which is right and good. Don't let go of it. This is 2 Thessalonians 1. And starting in verse 1, James, please. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. Mm. 
so that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Stop right there. You read that and say, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> this doesn't sound too good. Read verse 3 and 4 again, James, please. So that, we're going, please. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Verse 5. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Yep. Verse 4 is saying you're going through a lot of tribulations. You, you, you got to express. You got patience. You got faith. And you have endured. And that word endure means to, to hold to oneself up against. I mean, I can put that again. To, to hold, no, I'm sorry. To hold oneself up against. To put up with not turning and running. They are going through tribulation and, and things, and he said, this endurance is, you can get out of it. That's what he's saying. You can get out of it, but you're not. You're holding, you're going through it. <laughs> That's what it means, to hold oneself against it. Uh, i put it this way. This, if this was a hot piece of metal, <laughs> ah, I can get, I can, I can put my hand back. But if I, this is tribulation. I put my hand on it, oh, oh, it's burning, oh, it's hurting, oh, it's burning, yes, it's hurting, oh, it's burning. I hold my hand there and take it when I could take it off. That's what he was telling me. You know how you get out of tribulation and persecution? I've asked this in the church some years ago. I said two things. I use the word discrimination since people are racism, racism today, I don't like to use that word, but discrimination and persecution, which one is the hardest to take? If you are discriminated against because you are a woman, can you change that? And not with surgery, I don't mean that surgery stuff, no. <laughs> no, can you change being a woman? No. Can I change being African-American? No. But if I'm persecuted, there's a way out. Stop following Christ, stop believing the word of God, stop obeying, and you get out of it. That's what they were doing. Some things you cannot get out of. You cannot get out of being a woman. You cannot get out of being a female. <laughs> you, you're a woman, you're a woman. I don't like women. You, know, I, you can't work here. Well, you can't change that. But when you're persecuted, they're persecuting you for what you believe and what kind of religion you practice. They don't like that. You can get out of it. All you have to do is say, I'm through with it. Bye. And hit the door and out you go. And the persecution will stop. Persecution is the hardest thing to take because you have an open door to get out by saying, I don't deal with Jesus Christ and the Bible anymore. I'm through with it. I, no, no, no. Okay, I, thank you. You're right. I'm, I'm through. And they said, boy, we got them. We got there. We got them good. Uh-huh. Then they'll pat you on the back and become your friend then, see. You, you can get out of it. That's why persecution is so hard to take. You can get out of it. And this one right here was to hold oneself up against, to put up with not turning and running. You stand there and take it. And what did he say about that congregation? We are abound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because of your faith groweth exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all towards each other aboundeth. When the true church of God, the people that belong to the living God, goes through hard times, the brothers and sisters get closer together. Look at the church in the book of Acts. The church was being persecuted. And they, every day they were eating bread, going from house to house, praying and going through scriptures. Every day. 
They were being persecuted. They weren't going apart. They were standing up against it. That's what Thessalonians were going through. And they were facing Gnosticism. This knowledge of Jesus Christ and these scrolls you got, ah, they don't listen to that stuff. I got something better. I'm getting it from the spirits. Huh? From the spirits. They're better than the apostles and Jesus Christ. And they started persecuting these people, taking their land, taking their f f f f crops, talking about them, not letting them be a part of society, doing everything they could to be persecuted, to put pressure on them, to cause them to break. That's what persecution is for, is to cause you to break away from God and say, I quit. I'm through. I'm gone. Bye. And then they'll say, that's one we got. Another one bites the dust. But prejudice or bias or someone discriminate against you, you can't change that. You learn to live with it no matter who you are. And, and persecution is a two-way street. I mean, per discrimination is a two-way street. It's not a one-way street. Everyone has prejudice. Everyone has bias. Everyone has bigotry. Everyone will discriminate. I don't care who they are. I don't care who they are, males or females, young or old, in it, the north, south, east, or west. They will do it because all of us do it. When you hear someone on the telephone, you preach us, don't you? When, I, when I'm talking to someone on the phone, you're thinking, oh, sounds like a nice person. Sounds like a short person, a tall person. Oh, hello there. You know, he sounds big, and he may be that tall. <laughs> I see the guy that, what should you prejudge? He's a short guy, or he's a big guy. And then you see, here's someone that's, 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 that's a big dude. And, Hi, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and you, you judge, that's, that must be you know, a short, small guy. Maybe he's a, a jockey, you know, those horse jockeys, 115, 110 pounds. Those guys eat peanuts sometimes, one peanut per day. To, and, they drink, and they drink a small amount of water and they get, try to get rid of it as soon as they can. When they go weigh in, they want to weigh under 115, they want to weigh 112, 110, because the less the horse has on his back, the faster he can go. And they said they live sometime off of one peanut a day. And some of them will do bulimia to keep their weight small because the better they are and the smaller they are, the less the horse has to carry and more jobs they get and more money they make and they ruin their health to make that. I think by eating a peanut a day, now I, I've, eaten, <laughs> I've eaten slim a few times, but one peanut, you know, that's nothing. But they will do it. But you, we do prejudge, we do have biases. Everyone has it. It's not a one-way street. Everyone has done it. I don't care who they are. They've done it. I've done it. I did it in the Air Force. I haven't done it in the church as best I know of because I'm, I know I shouldn't. But anyone that's out there, normal human being, they will do it. Politicians, doctors, whomever it may be, have biases, prejudice, and bigotry, and they prejudge, and they do things against other people because of certain reasons. They do it, and I know that, and they know it. The ones that yell the loudest are the one that's doing it the most. The one that yell the loudest is the one that's doing it the most. That takes the attention away from them and puts it on someone else. I wasn't born yesterday. <laughs> I really wasn't. I've been, I've been far north as Alaska, far west as Hawaii, far east as Buffalo and Miami, far south as San Antonio, and, and all in between, males and females. Before the church, after the church. I've been around all, I've seen it all. I won't say everything, but I've seen all facets of everything, and I've been around a lot of it. So I know it's, the one that yells the loudest is the, one that is, is the one that's the most guilty. I know that. Let's go over to 2 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3. James, will you read 2 Timothy, please? Uh, uh, starting in 4 1, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. After their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, 
and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Thank you. We'll stop right there. What did he tell him? He said, teach, 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 because the time will come when they, he's not talking about the people outside, the sinners, those are, that, that they don't care about the Bible. He's talking about those in the congregations. In the congregations. He says, you got to teach it. You got to preach it. You got to teach it. You got to live it. He told him earlier, you got to live it. You got to teach it because the time is going to come. And that was in the first century. What about the 21st century? When they will, will come, when they will not endure. That word again is to hold oneself up against, to put up with the truth. They will not put up with it. You're not going to tell me I got to do it. I know. And they're going to walk out. And they're walking out of the church of God, out of the people of God, because they will not put up with reproving, being instructed, being told, being told the truth. And they see it written here. I'm not going to put up with it. And they'll walk out on it. That's what it means. They will not endure it. They will not stand up against it. And they're going to go out looking for, because they're going to have itching ears, myths, stories, fairy tales, genealogies, all of these things. Oh, I like that. So you can study genealogies all day, and it will not reprove you. It will not rebuke you. It will not instruct you in righteousness. Oh, my genealogy goes back. I don't care how far it goes back. It goes back to the Garden of Eden. That's how far it goes back. <laughs> it goes back to Adam and Eve. That's where it goes back to. And all in between, who, who knows what has happened? <laughs> Everything, a lot of things have happened in between. You can know your genealogy, no one does. Let's go to, say this, to Noah. You could trace it back to Noah if you want to and his sons. What good would that do you? In the book of Corinthians, it says, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ and give an account for what we have done in our bodies. It's body right here from shoulder to shoulder, head to foot. He's not going to say, oh, you are distant, 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 third, fourth, 25th cousin of Abraham, <laughs> of, of, of Noah. Oh, I am Jesus. Yes, come on in, son. Yeah, Noah's your 55th cousin. <laughs> He's not going to say that. <laughs> He's going to say, I want to, I got something I want to talk to you about. And he'll have your entire life from the date of birth to the later date of your death recorded in color, audio and video. No redacting, <laughs> scratching out stuff, no. You won't have a word to say. But I was told that my genealogy goes back to Alexander the Great. What are you talking about? <laughs> Alexander the Great, well, what does that do with you? He has, a, he has his own accounting to do. You have your own accounting to do. So he's saying here, brethren, that they will not stand up under sound doctrine and they will turn themselves and find in myths and fables, cute little stories about this and about that. Uh, this, here it is, this has an error or you can get out of it, your choice is to hold up against it or not. You can get out of this. There have been people who walked in this congregation, walked in many congregations, and they've asked me questions, asked other elders questions, and you give them the answers. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. They don't come back anymore. They call or whatever. Well, I know that's right and that's true, but... My grandmother or my grandfather or my third cousin, they expect me to go, they, they don't want to say, go against the word of God. So they do that and they settle for those cute little family stories. You know, the Bible does teach, is God in country? Where, what does it say that, God in country? I haven't seen it in a place in here. I don't see Jesus Christ teaching God in country. I see Jesus Christ saying, God and your neighbor. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your might, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. You don't see him teaching God in country, God in flag, God in this, God in the Constitution. He doesn't teach that. 
But some people will not deal with God's words because they want to get on that stuff and they like it. It's not going to benefit you at all. We're not going to be judged on did we keep the Second Amendment. You know, you, you, you carry a gun. <laughs> He's not going to judge. Oh, John, you didn't, you didn't, you broke the Second Amendment. He could care less about the Second Amendment. <laughs> he may say you broke the Second, uh, second Commandment. Now, now I'm in trouble. <laughs> because I'm, I bowed down to an idol. Now, now I'm in trouble. Not the Second Amendment, all those things like that. So hold on to the Word of God. Stay with the Word of God. I got to tell you this. I, 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 I know I've said these things over and over again, but I got to. Uh, Hebrews 11 and verse 27. Stand up against it. Because when you stand up against something like that, there's always a way out. And if you take the way out, uh, you're going to have to give an account of that too. Some things you can't give an account of. Hebrews 11 and James, not James, sorry, uh, Michael J. Hebrews 11 and verse 27. Uh, let me see. I think that's the one I want you to read. Hebrews 11 and verse, yes, uh, stop in verse 24. Start in verse 24 down to 27. Mm -hmm. Deeming the reproof of Christ to be more riches than the treasures of the Egyptians, judging the rebuke of the Messiah is to be greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Mm -hmm. For he did held into the rewarding. <clears throat> By faith he forsook Egypt and dreaded not the hardness of the king. Mm -hmm. For he abode as seeing him that was invisible. Okay, we'll stop right there. I'm going to pick the old King James words here in verse 27. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. And you read that in Have you all seen the movie, uh, The Ten Commandments, uh, see it, Cecil B. DeMille's? The first time I saw that, when I wasn't a part of the church, I hadn't read the Bible. I said, oh, that's kind of nice. Then I read the Bible, and I, I saw it, and I said, wait, they're off right here. They're off right here. Do you remember something? This verse right here, verse 27, is talking about something that Moses did, and they, in the movie, let me go to the movie. The movie is when Moses went out there, uh, where is this second? Exodus 2, Exodus 2. Go to Exodus 2. Exodus 2. We're going to see something here that I think maybe you know it. I just found out myself. Exodus 2, because the movies don't tell you the truth. <laughs> they make a movie, and <laughs> they're trying to make something look. Exodus 2. Um... We'll stop right here. Let me ask. Now, in the movie, it's not in the Bible here. You remember Moses went out, and, he, and, and an Egyptian was beating one of the Hebrews, beating him. You remember that? In the Bible, that's right. And Moses looked to the left, and he looked to the right, and that's, they don't, I don't think that's in the movie. And he got whatever he was, he killed the Egyptian soldier. Then he buried him in the dirt. And then next time you see Moses, Pharaoh has him at the edge of the city, exiling him, go, running him out of the town. Right, he exiled Moses out of Egypt. So, wow, and I believe that. Until, let's go over to Exodus 2. We'll see what, what he meant here. Exodus 2, and uh, we'll go over to Marie. Exodus 2 and verse 11, watch this. Exodus 2 and verse 11. <laughs> and it came to pass.
came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their virgins. And he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he <laughs> slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said, and he said to him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Now do you see the Pharaoh here exiling him? No. When he heard that soldier had been killed, he said, Where is that Moses? I'm going to kill Moses. And Moses fled. He became a fugitive from Egypt. He fled to avoid pers uh, a prosecution. He didn't voluntarily come to the city and say, Moses, I'm tired of you. I'm kicking you out of this country. You're a man without a country. Get out of here. Moses skipped town. <laughs> he ran. That's not in the movie. He ran away. Now, what does that make Moses? A fugitive from Egypt. If he goes back, guess what? Arrest that man. That's right. That's what Hebrews is talking about. Moses left and he came back. He was a fugitive. Pharaoh could have arrested him, could have put him in prison, could have killed him then. Because he went in to see Pharaoh. He went in to see the man. Yes, Marie. Oh, wait. God told Moses that all those who wanted your life are dead. Where is that? Uh, it's when Moses was returning with, with his wife. At the burning bush, right? No, it's after the burning bush. When he was returning with his wife uh -huh. and I wish I knew that. I am, okay, hold, hold on, let's see that one. Oh, Zipporah, that's in chapter four. Zipporah, yeah. Okay. And that's, I think it was in there. It okay. Got, that, maybe it was before that, but it got told him that okay, so, those that wanted to kill you were no longer alive. Okay, read verse 18, I mean, in chapter four. Okay, okay, they've died. Okay, okay. So uh, you got it. You're right. You're right, Marie. <laughs> Thank you, Marie. <laughs> but he still was a fugitive. <laughs> he really was. He still was a fugitive, and it says in Hebrews here in verse 27, by faith, faith in God, he forsook Egypt, not, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured seeing him who was invisible. Wait a second. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. I'm, I'm getting this is the way he came back to see the king, but when he, because when he left Egypt, he went to Midian, he was out there 40 years. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Because that wouldn't work, not fearing the wrath of the king, because he did flee because of the king. But while he was out there, whom, whomever these people were that wanted to kill him died. So Moses was afraid to go back, but he still was a fugitive. He still was a fugitive. 
Yeah, he still had murdered that man, and they knew that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But the movie doesn't show it that way. It shows you old Breno <laughs> taking him to the edge of town and, and exiling him. But he didn't exile him because they make movies like that. But what it was, it means to place this, this word here for endure in Hebrews means to place, to place underneath, to hazard, to, su to suggest. He hazarded it to go back into Egypt. It was not a, he didn't have a welcome wagon there. It really wasn't, to those people that wanted to kill him, may not, they may not have been alive, but it was a hazard for him to go back, considering going back to a nation, a country that you had killed someone and you had been gone so long, and they may have thought he came back to become the Pharaoh. Now, you can see a lot of things in people's mind. This guy coming back, what is he doing now? And he went back there and he went in to see Pharaoh. It wasn't the Pharaoh that uh, exiled him, apparently. This other Pharaoh here. And this Pharaoh said, no, what are you coming in here? These people are working. You're trying to make them stop working? So you can see here that this was to place oneself in a hazard or to place oneself underneath or to, or to suggest that you go back and do something that's going to put you into a hazard, hazards, uh, a place that you can get hurt or you can be killed. That's why he said he endured. He went back, didn't quite know, because he was afraid. He was afraid. I would be. Yes, James. Give James a mic there. Thanks, thanks, Marie. That scripture, I, I thought about uh, Joseph and Mary when you said the angel took to Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, James. Uh, sorry, I think from what Marie brought out is that maybe that was an excuse that he was giving God. And, oh, I can't speak. Oh, because okay. he, he hadn't been told yet that the people were dead. People were dead yet. Yeah. Now, that, that's interesting. <laughs> it could have been because he could speak. He was, he was taught in the best. He was going to be Pharaoh. He was going to be the next king. They, they sent him to the best schools. They had the best instructors. They taught him all the languages of other nations and so forth. He was a really sharp guy. And he said he couldn't talk. He was making a, that, that's the point there, James. He may have been thinking about if I go back, they are going to do me in. My life has been great out here just tending sheep. And, and it's nice. I, from what I understand, tending sheep is pretty, it's quiet. <laughs> <laughs> they don't, it's not like cattle moo, mooing all the time. Well, it was far better than tending to the children of Israel. Yeah, <laughs> you're dealing with those Israelites was hard too. <laughs> but, but see where it says, mm. in the verse that Marie read, it mm. says, let me go, I pray thee, and return unto my brethren which are in Egypt, and see whether they be yet alive. He knew that they were alive, didn't he? Or was this a lack of faith? That's yeah, I think, uh, yeah. Moses is like any other human being. <laughs> All of us are like any other human being, and only God and his Holy Spirit in us can make us different and above other people. Not, not better than, but above and have faith. We can see a lot of people that were called by God, they really gave a lot of excuses why they shouldn't do it. They didn't say, now Isaiah said, um, send me. But Amos didn't want to go. He said, I'm out here dealing with sheep and walking behind cows, picking mushrooms or whatever he was picking. And that's all. I'm, I'm happy doing this. Jonah. Yeah, Jonah. <laughs> yes, Marie. And God was really getting upset with Moses, too. Yes. Because of all excuses. Yep. He had more than one excuse. Yep, he had a lot of excuses, didn't he? But what this is showing also, Moses, maybe his character, he really was a meek man anyway, I think. They said he was the meekest man on the face of the earth. That's written in the scripture. He's the meekest man on the face of it. He didn't write that. Someone else wrote that in there. <laughs> I'm the meekest man on the whole earth. No, he didn't. I'm proud I'm so meek, you know. <laughs> no. But, but you do see people really dragging their feet following when God called them to do certain things. They made excuses. Jeremiah said, I'm too young. He was 17. He said, I'm too young. I, I, I'm a kid. I, I can't. So no, I call you from your mother's womb. Huh? I, I knew you in your mother's womb, Jeremiah. 
How did you know me? I made your head the way I gave you the spirit in man, and I made you the way you are, and you can do what I want you to do. And we're all the same way. He gave us that spirit in man. Everyone has that spirit, that, that spirit element that comes from God, and that makes you what you are. Your brain is a part of it too, but really that spirit in man is what makes you. And the book of James says once that spirit leaves, you're dead. You're dead. Once that spirit is in you, you're still alive. And that spirit in man is knowledge, wisdom, your personality, how you like paintings and how you like greens and, and blues and how you like certain foods, you like coffee, you like water. All that is part of what you like and dislike. That's your spirit in man. That's you. But your brain has all that knowledge stored in it, all the books you read and all the pictures you've seen, and they work together. It's, it's a, we are wonderfully made. We need, we need the spirit in man. We need the brain. We need the body. We need all of this to operate as a human being created in the image of God. One more verse. Let's go over to Mark 4. Thanks, Marie and James. Good input on that. Because I, the first time I read the book of Exodus, I said, why is Moses, why is he just dragging his feet like that? He just kept dragging his feet and making excuses after excuse. And then you look at us as human beings, we make excuses too when God calls us. So. What if you think God didn't see him do what he did? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's go to Mark 4 and verse... Whoever has the microphone, let me see, Mark 4. Oh, let's go up to verse 13, 13, Mark 4 and verse 13. And he said unto them, Know you not this parable? And how then will you know all parables? The sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside, for the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. And the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things, enter in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on, gro on good ground, such as hear the word, and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. We'll stop right there. We've heard this sower of the seed. You notice here there are four types of soil. Rocky soil, <laughs> the, uh, I mean, the hard ground, like that sidewalk out there, the seed falls on that, that's the word of God that lies there. And the devil's like a bird coming, picks it up and eats it and takes it off. The next one is the person that is sown is given to them. This is the one we're gonna look at here in verse uh, 17. And it says, it is soon 16. And these are they which likewise are, and these are they likewise which are sown are on stony ground. It's soil, but there are stones below the soil. They, don't, they didn't work the soil to get the stones out so, be, so, it, so it would be good soil. Who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. The root goes down. Oh, this, oh, this is so. This is so wonderful. It goes down, and it hits those rocks. What are the rocks? And have no root in themselves. You got to have a root going down, a, a tap root, and the roots going off to give it strength and give it moisture. But it can't go deeply enough, and it cannot get a tap root down and the, the root, roots off to the side. They have no root in themselves, and so endure, but for a time. Now, that word for endure there is to remain, do not exit. They stay there for a time, and then they exit. 
They don't have that and they cannot endure through the tribulation, through the persecution, through the rejection, through people laughing at them, making fun of them. So they remain because they do, they, oh, I like the word. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. That's good. I like it. It sounds good. Oh, that's wonderful. And then someone says, where are you, what are you doing today? Oh, I'm, I'm reading the Bible. <laughs> you doing what? I'm reading the Bible. Are you crazy? The Bible will run you crazy. That's what I was told when I was a kid. The Bible will run me crazy. <laughs> so you, you read the Bible, it's going to run you crazy. And, and, now, and that's when I was, and now people are saying the Bible is outdated. Oh, we're progressives now. We're millennials and we're progressive. This, we don't need this old book. Get rid of it. We have all of these new books now. And you read the Bible, they laugh at you. And you pray, and they, you do what? You pray to who? God, the Father? Yes. <laughs> I, I depend on me. I can take care of myself. And they laugh at you. And the person has not and will not remain. He said, you got to endure. You got to remain. But they cannot endure. They cannot remain. And they take off, and they give in to the afflictions, the persecution, and go out and join in with those people and turn their backs on this. The four soils, there's only one soil. That's the one that falls on good soil and it brings forth 30, 60, some 100 folds. The other three are people that will hear, they don't care about it, they don't have deep enough root, are the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches I can get rich, I can make double time every Sabbath, and I, rather than Sunday, I can do this, I can lie here on this paper here, I can put a two here rather than a one, I can put a six rather than an eight, and I can just do all that, and they get, because I'm ripping people off, and they turn away from God for the riches of this world and, and the cares of this life. I want to go to a club where they really have a wild party. And it's, I like that party, and it's, I like the music and the people, and I miss that. That's the cares of this life. And your neighbor and your friends come by. I had a guy, young guy, mm, early 20s, ran around, and he met a young lady, real fine young lady. They got married. Nice couple, and he says, wonderful wife. I did the ceremony and all of them. And he came in one day and talked, this is years ago, and he came in where we were and, and said, oh, come in. He said, I'm having a problem. I said, what is it? My buddies all had pickups and a rifle in the back window and everything. They come by on Friday night after I get off work, and that's when I used to go out and party with them at the club and with the bar, I won't say bar flies, with the, in the club. You know, you're playing peanuts and darts and drinking, and there are males and females and everything. You're patting people on their seat. I mean, really, they did that. And they said, hey, man, let's go, all three of them. Said, and he said, no, I got to stay home. Oh, yeah, you're tired to your wife apron string. And he, and he was get, getting a little worn out on that. He came in and said, what shall I do? I said, don't go. <laughs> what is what is that tell him? He, he said, but they want me to go. I said, don't go. He looked at me. He wanted me to give him some complicated answer. Well, you need to read this, and you read this book, and you go out here and sit here. No. When they knock, now let's go. Come on. What do I do? I said, no, I'm not going. They're going to give you hard looks. They're going to look at each other and say, uh-huh, don't go. Close the door and let them walk away. That's the only way you're going to do it because they're going to come back again and again until they begin to say, ah, just leave him alone. Right. He did, and it worked. Yes, I said, don't go. That's all I said. Don't go. He, he was trying to figure out how, how was he going to let them down easy. There is no way to let them down easy. you got a wife and kids here now, and you have a family, and you, you're in the church of God. You can't go back and start partying around those bars and sitting around drinking beer and girls coming over and saying, oh, I'm by me a drink, you know. And they, oh, and you. <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about, what, what, what they do, because they're hanging around and get drinks. Oh, what are you drinking? And you've been drinking beer all night. And scotch. I want, some, I want a scotch, you know, something expensive. 
and all that kind of stuff. Oh, handsome. Oh, you're such a good looking guy and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's what he had done all long time, friends and so forth. And so his nice friends wants to do it again. Say, so don't go. That's all. First time they said, no. huh. Second time, huh. Third time, oh, let's leave him alone. Yeah, I don't deal with him anymore. He's married and tied to his wife's apron string. Good. They belong to each other. Yeah, he should be tied to her apron string. The two have become one. You don't need those bar flies anymore. You don't need to drink and you don't need the beer pong and all that kind of stuff anymore. You need to have your mind on something that is greater than that. And you don't have the hangover the next day. You know, get up in the morning, the phone rings. Ah, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> no, ah, ah. Don't talk loud. Don't slam the door. Oh, oh, oh. All those type of things. They, they, I told them, that's don't go. So you've got to remain where you are. And he said, this person, these people did not remain. They did exit. Because they were doing real good, 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 good. And then all at once, they left. Uh, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. See, these words endure are in here for the, in the Bible. They mean different things. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. I think that's where I want. Yeah. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. 3 and verse 12. Who has the Bible right now? Ah, no, just a second. Verse 7, start in verse 7. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobates concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, <laughs> persecutions, afflictions, which came upon me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, but persecutions I endureth, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Stop right there. Oh, verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We we'll stop right there. We want to read about evil men waxing worse and worse. Verse thirteen. This is when you look at this world we're living, and you got to read verse thirteen. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. That's going to go on. The world is not going to get better and better. Men are going to get worse and worse. Think about your life. 20 years back, what things were going on 20 years ago and you thought it was bad then. Have things gotten worse and worse and worse? Yes. Think about 10 years from now, it's going to get worse and worse. And that's what it means you got to endure through that point because it's going to end one day for you. I don't know how and there's something else is going to start. But as men and seducers are going to get worse and worse. It's not going to get better. It just can't. Human nature goes down. We want to sin. We, are just, we want to go down. We want to pull other people down. We go down. That's why you, can, you could go into a bar. I'm going to mention a bar. Go into a bar. All the liquor there, and it's, it's right, real nice and neat. And, and, and you sit in there, and people drink for a while and drink for a while longer. And all at once, you find tablecloth falling off, you hear glasses from the floor, wasting stuff, it starts, we start getting dirty, getting sloppy. It does not go up, <laughs> it goes down. And that's what he means, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. But I want to read in verse um, 11, I endured, and the word for endure there means to remain, not to exit. I stayed under the persecution the afflictions, I did not leave them. They stoned Paul in Iconium. 
They stoned that man. And they said they left him for dead. They drug him out to the dump. They drug him out to the dump and left him out there. He was dead. Some say he was dead. They stoned that man and they left him out there. And some of the disciples said, what happened to him? They, they, they killed him and took him out to the dump. <laughs> they went out there and he, they was looking, standing over him. He opened his eyes. Well, Paul, yeah. He got up and went to the town of Lystra, preached there, and came back through Iconium. <laughs> and teach, they just tried to, they just stoned the man to death. He came back through there and started teaching again. That's what he meant. He said, I remained and did not run away from it. <laughs> he did not. He did not run away from it. Agabus came to him and, and, had a, and took his satchel, satchel, and tied it around Paul and tied his hands and say, the ones, tied his own hands, the one who be belongs to this bond, this is what awaits you in Jerusalem. Bonds. You're going to be bound up and you're going to be taken off. And he said, Paul, please, come on, Paul, please don't go. They were weeping. Over, said, don't, they were crying. He said, don't weep. My life isn't dear to me. He got him, went on to Jerusalem. Guess what happened? He got there. They arrested him, tied him up, put him on a ship, sent him to Rome. <laughs> and it was shipwrecked on the way. He said, I didn't run away from persecution. That man was power packed. He had a dedication that only Jesus Christ, I think, is superior to, to do something. Someone tells you, and you can get out of it, you know they're waiting for you there. And this man is a prophet of God, Agabus. He, he prophesied about a, a drought, said there's going to be a drought, and it was one. And the church at Jerusalem had needed food, and other churches took, brought food up to them. There was a drought. And Paul comes through and says, Paul, here it is. You're going to be tied up like this, and, and you're going to go to jail. Okay. And they begged him, and he cr they cried over and said, please don't go, Paul, please. He said, my life is not dear to me. Don't weep over me. And he went to Jerusalem. They got him there for a while, and they arrested him. And they messed with him for a while and sent him off on a ship to Rome. Shipwrecked. The ship got wrecked. Boom. He's out floating in the deep for a day and a night in the water, floating on a piece of wood, floating. And he came ashore, and the people there were barbarians. They, didn't, they, they were not civilized people. They were called, we called head, headhunters. They killed people and ate people. So they treated us so nice. <laughs> Made a fire and Paul picked up some sticks and a snake was in it. Cow, bit it, snatched onto him. He <clears throat> shook it off. <sighs> and he, they said, he's going to die. And a few, they went, he's going to die. They watch him. The sea didn't get him. And, and the curse, he's going to die. They watched him and watched him. He kept on fixing the fire and got a fire going in there. <gasps> He's a God. <laughs> they, they didn't know what to think about that. I mean, he said, no, 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 I'm not a God. And he started teaching them because he could speak in languages. He, he could speak in languages. Any language Paul, please, he went to, he had to be able to communicate with the people. And they call them barbarians because barbarians, they said, they, they say, ba, 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 ba. That's the way they talk, ba, ba, ba. That's where, that's where the word barbarians come from, ba, 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 ba. And, and Paul got there, and he could speak in languages. He spoke to the, the chief and spoke to the other people there. And this man had some kind of a dysentery problem, and Paul healed him. And they had tried all the herbs on him, tried everything they could on Paul and then I mean, on this man. And, and he was a chief. You know, he was a big man. They wanted him to be well, but he couldn't. And Paul hit, healed him. He was well as he could be. Whoa, they brought other members of the village over and they healed them, healed them, healed them. They gave them food, treated them real nice. Another Roman ship came by, picked them up, took them on to Rome, had him chained. He said, my life isn't dear to me. He got over there, so he met some of the brethren and, and glad to meet them. They, they really refreshed him. But he, he, he was just a man dedicated on what he was going to do. And he remained in that position. He didn't run from it. So. That's what he said here. He remained. He did not exit from it. We better stop soon. One more, and we'll stop. I want to uh, go over to Hebrews 6 and verse 15. I think that's the one. I, uh, maybe I'm wrong. I think I may be wrong. Then maybe. 
Hebrews 6. Did we read that? Hebrews 6 and verse 15. Uh, no, wait. Starting in verse 10, starting in verse 10, whoever has it to 15. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. We'll stop right there. Hear that word endure again. <laughs> endure. Now, don't forget, now, what, did, what was one of the promises that God made to Abraham beside this one? When he met it, yes, yes, Marie. Yes, he promised him a child. Yeah, okay. So, so, so he had two great promises. I'm going to give you a child, and also your seed would be like the stars in brightness. It says, after he patiently endured, he received the promise. He did not receive the promise of stars and, and like, like brightest stars. He got the promise of Isaac. Isaac. And that word, therefore, endure means to be long-spirited, to be patient, long patience. He had to wait 15 years, around 15 years, I think, with a, a little... A, Esau was, Esau was 15 years old, I think. Yeah, Abraham was 85. Yeah, he was 85, and he was 100 years old when he and Sarah had the child. 15 years, he waited. That's what that means. He endured, and that word means to be patient, to be long patient. Have you been to a doctor recently? Yes, I have too. What do they call you when you go in there? Well, oh, say it a little loud, that bell. I mean... Patient. You know what that means? They don't mean in a waiting room. <laughs> no, they're talking about what they will take you through. You go in for a physical, an eye exam, anything you go in for, you have to be patient. <laughs> because they're telling you, and I want you to look through, when you take eyes, I take mine, you know, get up, look through, and look through there, and he's asking, what do you see? You know, I see Z's and I's, and you know, those, those are dancing. Okay, what do you see now? What do you see now? Look, in, look through this. They blow hot, blow air in your eye. They put glasses on you. Do a lot of. You got to be patient. Now let me walk up to you right now and try to do that to you. You say, "Get out of the way! What's wrong with you, John?" But a doctor expects you to be patient, and you expect to be patient to the doctor. But if I go back and say, "Bella, I want to give you a physical," no, sorry, Michael J. I want to give you a physical. He was saying, "Not on your life." <laughs> But if a doctor came in with well, a stethoscope and everything and back in the office, gave you a physical, Michael sit down and look in his ears and do all of this. They hit, hit your knees and they'll do all that and you'll sit there patiently and do it. <laughs> but if James tried to do it, I tried to do it. You said, James, get out of here. <laughs> You're not going to give me a physical. <laughs> and so what God is saying, Abraham was patient like a patient when he walks into a doctor's office. He knows that something is going to occur and he's willing to sit there and go through all of that stuff. They, you know, change clothing, put the little coat on with the little tie behind you and all that. You don't like that. <laughs> and but you patiently do it. And you patiently let them look at you and do things and ask you questions, personal questions, very personal, not very personal. I won't ask you personal questions like that. No one does. But you are patiently enduring. That's what Abraham did. He told him, you're going to have a seed. A child. He patiently waited while God took him through a physical. <laughs> That's what that means. You sit there and you endure and you will do it a long time. Waiting in the waiting room is not patient. 
It's patients when you get in that chair, dentist, eye, or physical, with, do this, turn your head this way, say ah, and all that kind of stuff you got to do. Now, those are words for endure, all of those things that we looked at tonight here. And we'll stop now. I'll stop now because I went through Sabbath about being patient, not patient, but enduring this world we're living in. You got to endure it because the world is ran by the principalities, powers, dominions, and thrones, and, and rulers of the darkness of this world. And God allows them to do certain things, and then he'll stop them. Then he allows them to do certain things, and he will stop them. Do certain things, and he will stop them. So we have to be patient and endure through these things because they will not last forever. They will not. Be strong. Stay in the word of God and don't ever let anyone push this away from you and say it's, it's not worth it and that it's outdated and you, you, oh, you, yeah, you, oh, you, oh, you, out. how old are you? I'm 16, 17, yeah. <laughs> you read that old book, that old outdated book? Yeah. This book right here is a book that is a book of life. Keep you from stealing, lying, a lot of things it keeps you from. Heavenly Father, in the name of Christ Jesus, our Savior, our Lord and Master, thank you. Thank you for your word. It's wonderful, Father. It's wonderful. There's nothing better than this. And I ask, Father, according to your scripture, that you will write this in our hearts, write it in our inward parts, that would be with us every place we go, every day of the week. And if we rise in the morning, we go to bed at night, that we will be thinking about your word and how good you are, your creation, and how much you love and care about each one of us. Thank you, Father, for this. We give you thanks in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.